Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very pleased to welcome Patrick Cantley to the interview room. Patrick, welcome back to the Masters. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick's currently ranked number four in the world. Uh, actually, for the last four consecutive years, you've been ranked in the top ten in the world. This is your seventh Masters, and uh, I'm sure you've learned. You've had some great rounds out here in the past, and I'm sure you've learned from those experiences. How is that influencing how you're preparing for this week? Yeah, um, not much new about the golf course this year, 13 and 7 green, so spend a little more time on those holes. Um, and golf course seems to be in really good shape, uh, but it looks like it'll be soft uh, this year, so uh, should be good. Let's open it up for questions. Yes, please. Patrick, I think because of your measured demeanor, people think that golf-wise you're kind of a tactician, like point A to point B, really efficient. Are they right about that, or are they sort of undervaluing your, your artistry? I'm not sure. I don't uh, think about it too much. Um, you know, I feel like I try to be pretty aggressive off the tee uh, out here. That's really not um, different than anybody else. There's a lot of drivers around this golf course. And then I try to hit smart shots coming into the greens and leave myself good looks. Um, and that's really important here. I think putting from below the hole is really important here and leaving yourself in the correct spots when you do miss uh, is really important as well. Doug? Yeah, well, what was your um, pre-master's preparation? Did you come here ahead of time? Yeah, I came about uh, 10 days ago and played a couple rounds. It was raining. Uh, one of the rounds played with Perfect. Adam Scott one day. Uh, watched him make a hole-in-one on number six. And uh, yeah, we had a really nice time. Curious, it seems like, where uh, I feel like I've heard you say over the years that, that you basically treat every tournament the same way. Is that fair? Yeah. Is that important to you here, uh, practice round ahead of time, notwithstanding, to just treat this like a normal week? And what do you think that does for you? Yeah, I think that this golf course changes the most of any golf course year to year. And then this week is obviously really busy when we're out here. There's lots of people around, a lot more than other practice rounds. And the week tends to be uh, very long. So opposed to coming in maybe on Sunday and playing then and seeing the changes, I like to see them uh, beforehand. And then once tournament week comes around, have my schedule be the same as any other week. Any more excitable on the first tee? I mean, it's a rough word there, but as, as excitable as you get on the first tee on Thursday that you would be at Pebble, Riv, wherever? Maybe a little. Um, yeah, I mean, there's something really special about the, the – the tournament and the golf course, considering all the greats have played here. And I think all of us that play the tournament feel that. James? Patrick, go back to that weekend in 19, I guess it was. I think you were 64, 68 on the weekend in the hunt. When you left there, left here that year, did you, could you not wait to get back? Were you like, okay, I can that I can win. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I've said before that, you know, coming back to the same golf course year after year is unique uh, to this tournament as far as majors go. And so the more good experiences you can have out here, I think benefits you going forward. And so I definitely try and draw on, um, you know, experiences like that weekend and know that I can do it. And, um, you know, it's also a golf course that I really like. So if I can stack up a bunch of good shots over the years, that should that should only help in the future. And being Kate, what has not, what has happened the last few years here? Has it been anything your game, or just you haven't played well on this week? This week? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I don't think you're going to play well every time you tee it up, and I think you have to accept that. And um, you know, you try and throw out those years and just remember the good memories and um, think about more what you want to do, not you know, what you're worried about not doing. Jeff. Patrick, we, uh, we heard a lot about the change at 13 this week, but haven't heard as much about the seven green. Uh, what'd you find there as a player? Yeah, I think uh, seven got a little more manageable to putt around that green. It was very extreme before, and it still uh, kept a lot of the same slopes, but I think softened it a, a little bit. And so I think you'll see balls won't feed back as much to that Sunday hole location on the right. And then also it should be easier to putt from down to the right up to the left. 
before that putt was really tricky because it crested and then went straight downhill. And it still does that, but it just is a little less. Do you find year to year the changes, be they big or subtle, kind of keep players sharp as you come here and kind of rediscover what the new Augusta will be? I think we've heard so much about hearing how putts break over the years, you know, and how there was an advantage to guys having seen the same putt year after year. And since I've started playing the tournament, I think they've redone darn near every green um, on the golf course in the last 10 years. So that is kind of out the window, I mean, um, with all the greens that they redo. So I think you just have to relearn it and almost try to forget about historical putts on some of the greens. Uh, 17 um, green is wildly different compared to when I first came uh, to the golf course and played it in 2012. So. It's hard to see on TV, but you can definitely notice it uh, when you're up there on the green. Alan. Uh, Patrick, as a member of the tours board, you've earned a reputation as driving a pretty hard bargain. How, uh, how seriously do you take this role in, in shaping tour policy? Yeah, I take, um, you know, I take that role very seriously. I think it's important for the players to do their best to be informed and then also to um, do their best to, to serve in that capacity if they are going to take on that role. So um, I take it very seriously and, you know, I'm just getting underway. I've had one, one board meeting so far and, um, you know, a couple more this year. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting more into it. Just a quick follow-up on that. What are your feelings about opposite events? Do you, do you think they dilute the, the tour product in any way? Mm, I'm not sure. I do know the tour has uh, a lot of events. And, um, you know, it seems like there's a tournament almost, almost every week. Um, I'm not sure about opposite events. I don't think I've spent too much time thinking about that in particular. Uh, more focused on, you know, in the recent months, the, la the changes that you saw maybe a month or two ago. So following up on what you said, it's been a longer wait, no, in a way. It looks like the weather is going to be there. It's going to be tough. So everybody talks about patience, but I wonder what, what that patience means to you. And if you can give me examples of how, what do you do this week on and off the course to stay patient. Yeah, I think it'll be a long week. Uh, usually when there's weather, the rounds drag on, and it looks like there may be some delays as well. Um, I imagine the golf course will play particularly long this year. And so I don't think that you'll see guys go for as many of the par fives as you usually see. Like if we play 13 or 15 with any type of rain, I doubt very many guys will go for those greens. And so I think not forcing the issue um, all week will be really important and kind of relying on um, you know your wedge game on the par fives and, and not not trying to take on more than you can when the conditions are less than ideal. Daniel. Two things, Patrick. There's, there's been two references already today about your, um, I don't know about reputation or how the public perceives you. Um, how do you think they should perceive you? What do you think your reputation should be? Work with me a little bit on this. I'm not sure it's my place to decide what people perceive me as. Um, I try to be as, as genuinely myself as possible. And, um, you know, I think those that know me, um, you know, I keep a pretty tight circle. And in general, um, you know, the people that are closest to me are the people that I trust and then I kind of let my guard down. But for most other people, I have a pretty decent guard up. And that's just kind of how I've always been. And I don't uh, worry too much about, you know, how people are perceiving me. Secondly, um some bad follow-up, but I, I wondered if you could um, kind of elaborate on some of your thoughts on the on the USGA proposal on the golf ball. What do you anticipate happening by the end of the year, by August, on this modified local rule? I'm not sure what will happen. There's a decent chunk of time between now and when they're proposing to implement. Um, so I'm not sure, and we haven't had um, a board meeting uh, since they came out with this proposal. I don't, I see a lot more problems with it than I see good that will come out of it. It's a rule that to me seems to primarily affect 
uh, professional golfers. And I don't see any positives for professional golfers uh, if this rule were to be implemented. So I'm not sure how it will um, turn out, but there's a decent, like I said, amount of time between now and when the proposal would go into effect. What would be your biggest argument against? I think I have a few, <laughs> but I don't see how it's reasonable to have the manufacturers spend tens of millions of dollars on creating a golf ball for people whose livelihood depends on the golf ball being as good as it can be and then have zero ROI on that golf ball. Um, it just doesn't make any sort of sense to me. Um, and I think that's the worst, I think that's the worst part about it. And not only that, but if you're not gonna make it for everybody, so if it's, it would be such a bad idea for the amateur golfer to do it, then it's definitely a bad idea for the pros. I just, I, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that pe the people that are thinking about this rule say, golf's in such a good spot right now, we can't touch it for the amateurs, but we're gonna do it for the pros. I mean, I think it's a very small amount of golf courses that the pros play and play tournaments on. And then for them to come out and say, you know, the game's under threat because guys are hitting it too far. I think that's, you know, searching for a problem more than identifying a big problem for the game of golf. And bifurcation, I don't think is good for anybody that plays the game. Why do you think they did it then? I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't heard the USGA in person tell me uh, different reasons. Um, it seems to me that they have an obsession with par, and it seems like they'll do anything to get a golf tournament back to par. And we've seen that through setups, setups that have been messed up, to be honest. And it seems like now they're trying to maybe go at it from a different angle and just have the guys hit it shorter. And you're number four in the world, but the, the guys ahead of you, there's been some talk of like a big three or, you know, those guys are really playing at a high level, does that motivate you at all? I don't think much about it, but definitely when I see other people win golf tournaments, it you know makes me hungrier to go out and win golf tournaments. Um, and those three have played exceptionally well the last couple years, and they've won a lot of big tournaments. So I think it's uh, rightfully so and understandable that people refer to them that way. Uh, last question, one. On a different matter, we asked you before about your relationship with Sander. And uh, I mean, I wonder beyond the wine and all these things, it, being able to share time and travel with, with a fellow competitor, I mean, what are the advantages? And is, is there any disadvantages? No? <laughs> um, I don't think there's many disadvantages. We played a couple tournaments uh, last year on Sunday uh, where we were both in contention and he got me once and, and I, I got him once. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of advantages. I think playing together as much as we do is good because he's one of the best players in the world. And the more you can expose yourself to players that are playing really good golf, I think it normalizes it for you. And so not only that, but you know, having a friend out here, we're out 20, 22, 23 weeks out of the year away from home. And so having someone to go out to dinner with um, and play practice rounds with has been has been really great for me. Thank you for your time, Patrick. We wish you the very best this week. All right, thanks, George.